Hello, my name is Elazar Prail, and the name of this presentation is How to Win the Retirement Marathon. Now, if you were going to enter a marathon, or even a half marathon, you wouldn't just walk up to the starting line and say, I'm ready to go and begin the race. You would have to train far in advance. You'd have to train for a long race, and you'd probably do different types of training. You want to do some sprinting, you want to do some strength, stamina, uphill, downhill, for all the different types of in, uh, conditions you might encounter. You'd need a race strategy. You would need to perhaps sprint out, then pace yourself, and perhaps leave something in reserve for that final kick. And you'd want to prepare for different contingencies. You don't want to leave anything to chance. Now, the same thing is true as we prepare for the retirement marathon, those last 30 years or more of uh, our lives. First of all, one would need to prepare in advance. You'd have to prepare for a long retirement. This is a race that, unlike a marathon, there is no finish line in sight. There's no telling how long it might last. Ideally, we would prepare for all conditions. If the market is up, if the market is down, what happens in case of infirmities of old age? The strategy would have to be one that makes sure that we don't run out of money, and ideally, we would like our income to keep pace with inflation. And finally, preparing for contingencies meaning, means having an estate plan in place, starting with a will, but including other things as well, power of attorney, health care directive, etc. Now, in retirement, we face unique risks. We'll identify what those risks are, and then we'll talk about ways of addressing them. The first risk is longevity risk, and this is one that a lot of people don't take as seriously as they should. Longevity in the United States has increased dramatically over the last century, but even more so in the last 20 years. And it's entirely likely that a couple in good health retiring at age 65, there's a pretty good chance that at least one of them will, leave, will live past 95. So a retirement planning scenario needs to cover 30 years or more. Another risk is inflation risk or purchasing power risk the amount that might be sufficient on the day we retire, 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road, will clearly not purchase as much as it did when we retired because of the effects of inflation. Another risk is called excess withdrawal risk or portfolio failure risk. That is, if you run down your portfolio, you run through your money too quickly, you could run out of money, which is how you lose the marathon. So you need a strategy that will allow you to deal with that. There's also a type of risk that's new to retirement called sequence of return risks. And this is completely different than the way we think about market returns in our accumulation years. As we're working and putting money away, whether it's in a retirement plan or a savings plan, we invest the money. And it doesn't matter whether you have good years first followed by bad years or bad years followed by good years. If the long-term rate of return is something in the neighborhood of, let's call it, 7 or 8 percent, it doesn't matter how you get there if at the end of the time it meets that target. In retirement, you're disinvesting. You're taking money out. And in that case, sequence, sequence of returns makes a huge difference. And I'll give you a historical example to illustrate this. Let's take two brothers, Aaron and Moshe. And as we know, Aaron is the older brother. So he retires first in 1995. And he has an account with a million dollars in it. And he decides to take 8% uh, a year or $80,000 a year out of that account. If you remember, the late 90s were great years for the market. So he, starting in 1995, taking $80,000 a year out of the market, 
five years later, we'll still ha we'll have an account value of over two and a quarter million dollars. He started with a million, he's taking out $80,000 a year, but the market did so well that his account balance actually more than doubled in those five years. Now in 2000, his younger brother Moshe retires, and he's also got a million dollars, and he also starts taking out $80,000 a year. As you recall, the early 2000s were not friendly years to the market. And therefore, by his taking out $80,000 a year, he's hit immediately with three down years. Even though the last two years are up years, at the end of the five years, his account balance will be less than a half a million dollars. Two brothers starting with the same amount of money. But because the return, you can't predict how the returns are going to come. If you get great returns in the early years, you will do very well. If you get hit with bad returns in the early years as you're taking money out, it can be deadly to a retirement plan. And finally, there's the long-term care risk, which is that as we get older and live longer, the chances of needing long-term care rise and become more real. Uh, the older we get, the more the risk increases. And so these are the areas that we need to address and try to plan for. Now, the goal in retirement is while we're working, many of us have regular steady income. And what we want to do is try to replace regular steady income with regular steady income. Now, when we're working and earning a salary, then that, that steady, regular steady income is accounted for. But how do you do that when you're no longer working? Well, the old plan consisted of what's called the three-legged stool of social security, a company pension, and private savings. What's the new reality? The new reality is social security is a wobbly leg although as we'll discover for those of us in or close to retirement, that's not such a, a big risk as we might think it is. Company pensions are less and less common. Many, many companies have gotten rid of them, turned them into 401ks or other kinds of uh, profit sharing plan, but it's not a guaranteed pension from the company. And what we're left with is private savings, which is primarily the 401k and whatever else we're able to save. Now let's look how these work. Social Security provides guaranteed income, and Social Security also provides a hedge against inflation because it's indexed for inflation. A company pension while it may not go up with inflation, but it also provides a guaranteed amount of money each year. The 401k is not guaranteed. That all depends on the performance of your specific account. Now, if you don't have a company pension, then the only guaranteed income that we have is Social Security. Okay. That is n not a terrible thing, but it's probably not going to be enough. If both spouses are eligible for the maximum Social Security benefit, which is probably not likely, then at full retirement age, which for most people born, anyone born after 1960, it's 67 years old. For those born between 1954 and 1960, it's somewhere between 66 and 67. And any, everyone else before 54, it would be 66. The maximum that they could get if they started collecting at 66 would be $60,000 a year combined between the two of them. If they both waited until age 70 to collect, that would also bring in an additional $20,000 a year or bring them up to $80,000 a year, but that's taxable money. Now here's something that, I, that may surprise you. It surprised me when I first heard it. Social Security benefits are taxable in the United States, but if you make Aliyah and live in Israel, 
the Social Security benefits are not taxable by either the United States or by Israel. So this might be a impetus to encourage and motivate people in retirement to make Aliyah. Now, in the absence of a company pension then, how can you guarantee more income? And the answer is by creating your own pension through using annuities. There are different types of annuities. Fixed annuities, variable annuities. An annuity is a vehicle that pays you out a sum of money for as long as you live. It's like the opposite of life insurance. In life insurance, you're insuring against an early death. With an annuity, you're insuring against longevity risk, against living too long. Once you have an annuity, you can't outlive that money because the company is obligated to pay you whatever they promise to pay you for as long as one lives. Now, fixed annuities, as the name implies, have a fixed rate of return and a fixed payout. Um, there is still a use for them, but considering the low interest environment in which we now find ourselves here at the end of 2013, it, it's not as attractive as it might be when rates were more normal. And once you buy the annuity, you're locked into that lower rate. And in addition, the fixed annuity has no inflation protection. A few of them build it in, but that means you're simply starting out with less and getting more later, but it's all the same amount of money. The other type of annuity is a variable annuity, which means that the money that you invest with the company is invested in some combination, some portfolio of stocks, stocks and bonds, and you would therefore are, have market exposure. Now this might be a scary thing to think about once you're in retirement because everybody is afraid of losing their money, so they don't run out of money. However, if you think about a 30-year retirement period or more, as we've been discussing, it's hard to imagine how you can make your money last without having market exposure. Because fixed income vehicles will barely keep pace with the rising cost of living. And therefore, it's important, even in retirement, to have a significant amount of market exposure. However, I'm afraid to lose my money. So this is where the variable annuities with the guarantees come in. Because what they allow you to do is invest the money in some type of market conditions, some portfolio, but it comes with a guarantee that as long as you don't take out money, they will increase your benefit base, they will increase your the amount that you can then draw off on later by a fixed amount each year, somewhere like five or six or seven percent. So if the market goes up, you, gain, you lock in that gain. If the market doesn't go up or goes down, they'll increase your benefit base regardless. And then after a period of time, you can choose to start taking money out at a guaranteed rate, like four, five percent sometimes 6% a year, depending on how old you are when you start taking the withdrawals. And as long as you don't exceed that percentage, they have to pay you for as long as you live. And that's the guaranteed part of it. So the day you buy the annuity, you know, worst case scenario, how much withdrawal amount you're going to have down the road. For example, if you wait 10 years, some annuities will double the amount of money that you originally put in and then you'll get the withdrawal percentage off of that guaranteed. If the market outperforms that guaranteed amount, you'll get the, the withdrawal percentage off of the higher amount. So it's a real win-win situation and it's something that's certainly worth looking into, especially for people who are afraid of the markets and don't want to have any money in the stock market. Here's a way to do it with safety. Now, there are fees that are associated with this. Nothing in life is free. The guarantees come with certain fees. So they will tend to impact on the returns of the market by about 3%. So if the stock market was up 10% th that year, your annuity may actually, uh, uh, 
your annuity equity portion may only show a gain of six and a half or seven percent. But that's still a lot better than half a percent that you'd get in, in a money market. Now, how, what about Social Security? Social Security is something that many of us grew up hearing horror stories about how it's running out of money, it's running out of money. And if you're like me, you probably in the back of your mind thought, well, it'll be nice if I get something when I retire, but I'm not counting on it. Well, lo and behold, it's not as bad as it looks. For those of us who are in retirement or near retirement, <coughs> it's probably safe to assume that we'll probably be okay. The Social Security Trust Fund, that's the excess taxes that they collect over what they pay out, is estimated to last until 2037. Okay, that's another 23 years. Any changes that are required to keep the program viable will probably affect younger workers not retirees and near retirees. Well, we've seen that there have been changes already that have made a big difference. When, when I was growing up, we all knew that retirement and Social Security started at 65. Some time ago, Congress changed it, and they made the, the uh, full retirement age for those born after 1960 is going to be 67. So let's take a look at a typical couple and see if we can figure out a strategy to get more out of Social Security. Let's call them Mr. and Mrs. Adler. Mr. Adler worked full time for many years. Mrs. Adler worked less years out of the home, so her cumulative benefit will be less than his. So here's a strategy to try to get more out of Social Security. Mr. Adler, the primary breadwinner, delays taking benefits until age 70. That will increase his monthly benefit by 8% each year or by 32% total for anyone who is 60 or older today. That's how the $60,000 at age 66 became 80,000 or 30 becomes 40. The higher amount is his for his lifetime and more importantly, if he dies first, Mrs. Adler steps up to his higher amount. So when you're tr trying to figure out is it worth it or not, the break-even point actuarially is about 84 years old. So if one of them lives beyond age 84, that means that they, they've, they would have gotten more out of Social Security by delaying until age 70 than by taking it age, at age 66. There are other strategies that are available to maximize income depending on individual circumstances and uh, you need to consult with your advisor in order to determine what the best situation for you would be. Finally, when thinking about long-term care risk, the risk is first of all that we'll need it and studies have shown that between around 70 percent of seniors will eventually need some form of long-term care and the expense. Now let's quantify this. These are numbers from the New York State Department of Health website. A licensed home health aide today in the New York area makes between 20 and 25 an hour or about $250 a day for an eight or 10 hour shift. If you multiply that by 365 days a year, that comes to $75,000 a year for a home health care aid. A nursing home, nice, ner decent nursing home. Well, the, the ones that they say is the average, it's 375 to 400. If, we, if you want something on the upper end, it may cost you more than that. That translates into a price tag of about $135,000 to $150,000 a year. And that is a lot of money. So some people think, well, I'll get from Medicare. Doesn't work. Medicare will pay minimally for long-term care. 
Well, what about Medicaid? Well, let, let, let's explain what Medicaid it, is. Medicaid is welfare for sick people. It's for people who are poor, who don't have any money. So in order to qualify for Medicaid, you would need to forfeit all your assets or write them over to, for example, your children, in which case you will lose control, legally lose control of the assets, in addition to which there is a five-year look-back period. So all of this transferring has to be done five years before the long-term care need arises. A better answer might be to arrange for your own insurance, long-term care insurance, that will provide money when you qualify. There are a lot of details involved, and it's too complicated to get into all the details now. But essentially, you get to choose how much money you want, how long you want the benefit to last for, how you get paid, whether it's reimbursement or whether it's uh, they write you a check, and you can spend any way you want. The, in, the inflation factor that you need to put in there, especially if you buy it at a younger age. These are all important considerations that you will discuss with your advisor when the, you decide that you want to look into this more carefully, more seriously. The advantages are the premium could be tax deductible if, you're, if you have a business. It's possible. The benefit is always going to be tax-free. And here's a real important one. For those of you who live in New York State, New York State gives you a 20% tax credit, not a deduction, a credit for long-term care premium paid. So if, for example, if your long-term care premium for the year was $5,000, when you fill out your taxes for New York State, they'll credit you with $1,000 toward your tax bill because of the long-term care premium that you paid. That is a really nice benefit. So let's summarize. We talked about the different risks that face us in retirement. Longevity risk, you prepare for that by having guaranteed income streams that won't run out. Inflation risk is harder to plan for, but Social Security helps. Being in equities, being in the market, having that exposure allows your money to grow beyond inflation as opposed to having all your money in or most of your money in, in bonds and fixed income instruments. In terms of excess withdrawal risk, well, we looked before at a person who took out 8% a year. That really is excessive. Studies have shown that the safe rate of return is around 4%. Um, most portfolios under, under almost all circumstances will survive for 30 years at 4%. Sequence of return risk is something that can really hurt you in drawing down a portfolio. One way to avoid that would be through the use of the guaranteed annu the, the, the variable annuities with the guaranteed living benefit riders. And in terms of long-term care risk, the way to avoid that or to plan for it is to get long-term care insurance. Much more than what is written here and then what we've discussed today is necessary to come up with a specific plan for you and your family. This is just a, a primer to get started and give you food for thought and I wish everyone well as they plan for their next 30 or longer years and hopefully in good health. Thank you.